All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second NI webinar in collaboration with the Center for Research Ethics and Bioethics from Uppsala University in Sweden. And my name is Rita Santos. I'm the NI Executive Director. And today we are going to learn on gamification of academic integrity. And for that, we welcome our three panelists from today who have dedicated their time and efforts in developing gamified tools to teach about academic integrity. We welcome Dr. Zinat Khan, head of the NI Gamification of Academic Integrity Working Group. We welcome Dr. Mads Godixson from the Horizon 2020 Integrity Project. And last but definitely not the least, we welcome Dr. Sonia Bialobaba, a coordinator of the Bridge Project. Welcome everyone. Thank you for your time and for being here with us. I'm sure your tools will be very relevant to our audience. <laughs> uh, our session for our session today, uh, each of you will have 10, maximum 15 minutes to present your tools. And then we'll dedicate the last minutes of our session to a discussion and to answer any questions the audience may have. So if you have any questions, feel free to, um, to write them down in the chat. This is open now and it will be addressed uh, later, uh, later in the session. So without further delays, Zinat, the floor is yours. I'll stop. Thank you. All right, I will quickly share my screen. Everyone can see my screen? Uh, it's coming. Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, um, Rita. Uh, and again, thank you, Sonia, for inviting me to this really exciting um, session. I think the NIA webinars generally are really great. Um, they're covering such amazing uh, topics across the board on academic and research integrity uh, that, you know, it's really great to see one session dedicated to gamification. Uh, gamification is like a really passion project for me. Um, I'm actually from IT. That's my background, but I'm always trying. I'm also teaching ethics. So, you know, I have to always find ways to kind of get people interested and, in, you know, engaged in the content that I'm teaching in a manner that talks to them in their language, right? Ours, we don't get to choose the students that walk through the doors in our classroom. So we always have to be um, on our toes and trying to figure out what else is dragging their attention away from our class and kind of competing with those technologies. And gamification is definitely one of those um, areas that is fantastic if you're if you know how to bring it into your classroom and use it. It even technology aside, just the concept of gamification in a classroom is usually fantastic um, to have. Um, I'm representing the wonderful gamification uh, working group in NI which started a few years ago um, as kind of like a, um, a Eureka moment that happened during a, a workshop that we were doing for students, where we actually did like a impromptu Jeopardy competition for students. And we saw suddenly students getting up and taking notice and running to the notice boards and writing their answers and trying to get there before the other persons. And the kind of the general enthusiasm and the excitement that we saw in students kind of worked our interest in looking at, hmm, could we look at gamifying academic integrity values and, you know, these modules and learning modules and stuff that's out there to make it more fun and more engaging for students. Um, that's how the gamification, um, the working group kind of came into being. Uh, just a disclaimer before I go ahead, some of the parts of this presentation have been taken from the proposal that we we as a team had put together uh, for the GIVE project from uh, the NI working group, as well as from some of the um, outside collaborators and the NI conference abstract submission that we have made from the working group and the project, which is currently under review. So as I was saying about the gamification working group, um, the aim of the group basically is to explore gamification and game-based learning. And I, in a minute, in a, in a bit, I will tell you guys the difference between those two uh, to enhance engagement and commitment of everybody, not just students, even staff, faculty members, management, and including even parents. Because when we look at academic integrity, we are not working in silos. We are definitely working across the supply chain, downstream and upstream. So we're looking at schools, students coming from schools we're looking at the employers um so you know we have to be able to always as i mentioned you know stay um on our toes about how best to approach the different stakeholders 
the the uh, the group really aims at looking at how can we bring gamification and game based learning into um, this sphere um, and you know not just us building games but also reviewing games that exist currently exist um, looking at what are the kind of games people are talking about people are using how are they using it um, giving advice on how best they could be using those tools if somebody's interested to take that tool and use it in their classroom or in their tra uh, training. Uh, we have a number of people that make up this wonderful working group. And as you can see, we are from all over. Um, we've, of course, got um, uh, Sonia. We've got Dr. Shiva, Sandra, Salim, Arita, Mike, uh, no Lorna, Laura, Jared, Dita, and of course, myself. So it's a very diverse group of members from NI who've come together who are really interested. And um, the group is quite active um, in terms of the kind of work that we are doing. In, uh, we've, we've come up with a review tool that you could be using to review existing games. We've come up with um, uh, basic steps on if you did want to develop a game uh, game uh, game based uh, system for your uh, you know any any kind of training or workshop that you're doing and then of course we've gone ahead and applied for the particular um, the the actual project that we're going to be talking about today uh, the projects have kind of gotten uh, we started off with a broad idea of academic integrity and decided we'll start small and then move upwards and so the first First thing that we started looking at, of course, is plagiarism. Uh, everybody here probably already knows what plagiarism is, but I'll just put that in there just in case uh, for clarity's sake uh, that, you know, when, when we're talking about plagiarism, we are talking about any kind of intellectual property that is used by someone without somebody else, the actual person's um, acknowledgement. Uh, we also, of course, have powerful text matching software already out there that helps faculty members um, in classrooms uh, to monitor text match that happens and to, you know, investigate if there is a possible case of plagiarism. So just a point again to note here, these are text matching softwares. They're not plagiarism so, uh, catching softwares or detection softwares. Um, the maximum they can do is highlight the text that is being matched with some other source that they have within their extensive databases. And then it's of course up to us to decide whether that is that constitutes uh, plagiarism or not. Um, other efforts, um, of course, across the world are things like honor codes that were traditional detection and punishment systems, educational approaches such as training modules, workshops, referencing materials, teaching students actually proactively how to do academic writing, what are these skill sets, what is referencing, what is citations, and so on and so forth. Um, the bigger issue beyond plagiarism that we have also noticed, of course, is the access to the multi-million dollar industry, which is the answer in providing so our companies and the academic support. And on purpose, we put those on code because that's how they promote themselves. We all know these are contract cheating sites. Um, you know, of course, everybody's been talking about it, artificial intelligence tools for content generation, and that's a wide range of tools, plus the predecessor kind of which is still existing to artificial tools, which is the paraphrasing and translation. So all of these are constant push and pull that happens in our classrooms when it comes to, you know, authenticity of students' work. So given this um, what we did was we went back and specifically looked at what is it that everybody says they're they're using, and a lot majority of the universities came back and said yes, learning modules, right? Having this proactive measure, which is like a feedback led interactive learning module, really acts as a deterrent for any of these above behaviors, but they don't always necessarily work either. Um, studies have also so shown that um, a lot of the time uh, there is this perceived um, a notion that they're inaccessible, uh, they're very wordy, they're in, you know, they're encouraging rock learning. Um, it's a lot of the times they've got these fixed five MCQs and, you know, you can just keep going back and do a trial and error. So it's not necessarily encouraging uh, deep learning, but rather just, you know, trial and error and just finishing it off. When, so there is a pro that definitely learning modules are the way to go because they seem to work, but majority of them do seem to kind of lag behind when it comes to um, really engaging students in the process of learning about academic integrity values and why they should not be engaging in plagiarism, um, et cetera, behaviors.
So that's where we started looking at uh, game-based learning, where basically we wanted to see um, how we could really use game-based learning um, in, in, in this sphere. And the things that we observed were, of course, that uh, research itself has said that, you know, there's greater engagement with participants. There is definitely knowledge retention that happens whenever you're using GBL. Um, there's a transfer of knowledge and skills beyond the immediate course or content, which is exactly what we need and want. We don't want people to get stuck at just um, exactly what's just being taught and that's it. And, you know, they're just able to apply it to that particular course and that's it. We want this to go beyond. We want this to become a second nature for, uh, for people to be able to um, acknowledge sources, et cetera. Um, here, I think I'll take a moment to quickly just talk about the difference between GBL and gamification. Uh, so GBL is what I just talked about, where we are actually using games to achieve a defined set of learning outcomes. Um, the example on this particular um, image that I've taken from Tech with Chick is uh, about Minecraft. We know a lot of classrooms use Minecraft. Um, now with Metaverse, for instance, um, I know for, for sure, like with our university, we are looking at how we can incorporate Metaverse in teaching ethics courses, right? So we are creating these, you know, little universes of dilemmas that students have to get into and then, you know, they have to make choices and, you know, they have to you know, then defend those choices and then come back out of it and then have that class discussion. So these are actual games that they are using, right? That's created and then they're using. Gamification isn't necessarily using a game, but game-like elements into your non-gaming context. For instance, um, the example that I've given right at the beginning, like I will give points to the first group that comes on the board and solves a problem absolutely correctly, 100%. They have to show all the steps, all the workings, and they have to get it right. So if it's something like that, that's where we are actually saying, we're ga I'm gamifying my class or I'm gamifying the concepts that I'm teaching because I'm using points or leaderboards. There is some kind of an element of competition in there. There's a reward system. I could be giving points, credits, marks, etc. So that's the basic difference between gamification and game-based learning. Uh, what we did want to do was we actually wanted to create a game-based learning system, not just have gamification. And that's where we kind of collaborated across the board. Um, so University of Wollongong, I'm from University of Wollongong in Dubai, which is the Dubai campus of the mother uh, mothership, which is the University of Wollongong in Australia. Um, the university has a lot of other campuses, for instance, the one in Malaysia as well. So we, uh, some of our colleagues got together um, with, uh, in partnership with NI's Gamification Working Group, and we decided we were going to look at how we could actually develop a game-based learning system. Uh, so this project, like I said, we aimed to look at completely everything to do with academic integrity values, but then uh, we kind of narrowed it down and said, we will start by focusing on one, the most prevalent one, that is plagiarism. Uh, the objective is to develop a GBS on, uh, you know, the topic of plagiarism, to raise awareness on academic misconduct and integrity, and to demonstrate the effectiveness of GBS in deploying an academic integrity module. Given this, um, besides us, we also had um, Leong Michel, uh, Tan Jin Ik and Anne Rogerson as part of this team. Uh, of course, the rest of the team was the list of names that I've given you in the beginning from our amazing gamification group members. So once we had this grant that we received, we decided, of course, to really put our heads together and decide how best were we going to go ahead and develop this. And we realized we really needed um, the input from the stakeholders, which is the staff and students who would ultimately be using this module that we are going to be designing. So we actually went and did a round of focus groups with with the um, you know with different campuses, staff and students, collected their expectations, put that down under you know we we studied those. Then we put down all our expectations. The content was developed in the background, and then we submitted to the design team the development team who then went ahead and um, developed and tested the uh, game-based module. Now that they've done that, we are in the process of determining its effectiveness and of course, um, releasing the beta, beta version. So that's, those are the, that's the part that we are actually at. We put it as a, 
um, as, as a cyclical process because we've, of course, gone back and forth a lot of time and we are continuing to work um, on the background information, looking at the target audience again. Um, it wants that now that the game is done, going back and getting their feedback again, so on and so forth. Um, this is just a small demo of what the game currently looks like. This, as I mentioned, we haven't released it yet because we are still in the process of um, doing the uh, the final the second round of focus groups with our students and staff from the different campuses to find out if this is something that they would be um, interested to do. Um, so as you can see, it's it's a little bit different than a normal learning module. It's not just having some kind of animation. It's a completely different um, system, which has questions and scenarios, and then it gives you some background information, and then it gives you a choice, like what should this person do, that person do. It's got the little bit of game board going on there with the number of stars, et cetera, how much, how many things have you got right and wrong. You can't just go back and keep Click, keep clicking to get it right, you would have to actually have to move forward with the game. So it's a little bit different than the current existing, like I said, um, the game, the learning modules that we have seen that exist in different universities. Um, so uh, as I said, we don't really have the final game yet, but we are in that process in the last phase of that project. Uh, we are quite excited because from the little bit of uh, focus groups we've already run this year, we've had very positive feedback from students and from staff. They were quite excited to see the little mascot that we have made that you can see, Captain Integrity. Um, the name of the game, game itself is Age of Integrity. So that in itself is calling out to students because it kind of, um, you know, meshes with the current name, game, naming, you know, um, uh, thing, uh, uh, culture that is existing. Uh, things that we came across and what's really making us successful is the mutual expectations and how we went about defining the scope of this project. Because as you can imagine, it's a large um, group of people working on one project. So we have really had to address these right at the beginning. Creating an identity for the group with like logos and short forms and things like that. Um, assigning roles such as project manager. Uh, communicating regularly, working with technology to aid in communications. This group is fantastic at outputs. We don't meet that often, but we do a lot of our communication through emails. Uh, we do meet, of course, when we have to make crucial decisions, but a lot of the decisions kind of happen uh, very much on, on the tech. <laughs> uh, we make recordings if we have to, meetings and save data in common cloud folders for everybody to be able to access. Um, develop artifacts of milestones, achievements to record progress, posters, videos, social media posts, just to keep everybody updated. At the same time, our sponsors, like the funding group, knows what we are up to, and the teams know, yes, these are this is where, how where the project is. So this is, in a nutshell, what is gamification, why we are so interested, and what is the kind of work or project that we are looking at from the NI working group. Um, a list of the references. There's a lot that I refer to for the slides. And I'm open to any question answers when we are done. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Zinat. Uh, so we'll save this, the questions later in the session. Mats, you are welcome to share your screen. So I will share my screen. And uh, thank you very much, Rita, for, whoops, this was not one I was supposed to show, this one. Hope you can all see it. Uh, so thank you very much for um, to the previous speaker and uh, for Rita and Sonia for inviting. I will present on a, a tool called Integrity Games. Uh, it is a little bit further in development than the previous one uh, presented, um, but, um, a little different in the sense that we didn't we didn't intentionally design a gamified tool. We just designed a tool, and it turned out it was gamified. So, um, but um, Integrity Games is a tool that was um, an online learning platform that is um, developed by the Integrity Project uh, that was funded by the EU. It is um, addressing um, mainly sort of uh, gray zone issues that dilemmas that students um, face during their university education. So it's aimed at uh, undergraduate students. Um, we had Europe as a starting point. So, so that's sort of the, the core group, but I've talked to people from all around the world um, and they've seen the game we presented at the World Congress on Research Integrity back in, in, in the summer. And that seems to be a, a worldwide um, relevant. 
importance for for the for the issues discussed in the in the cases. Um, it's a website. Uh, it's available in five different languages at the moment: um, English, French, and Portuguese, among others. So we are covering a, a very large uh, area. And you can find uh, on the website, you can find uh, a lot of what I'm going to say now and a lot of uh, additional tips and tricks for teachers about how to use this tool. Um, the basis for uh, Integrity Games is the Integrity Project, which um, started out by um, carrying out an extensive uh, survey um, of what are the dilemmas, what are the issues that undergraduate students actually face it, during their studies. And we took some of these um, sort of most common dilemmas that the students face and turned them into a, a little simulation uh, or, or a sort of a gamified simulation that uh, the students can play through before they reach, uh, they, they encounter the dilemmas in real life, basically. Um, and so uh, in that way, be um, able to reflect and, and be prepared for them um, when they meet them in actual practice. So let me um, show you uh, the tool uh, just quickly. Uh, so I'll just switch to my browser here. So this is the, the main page of Integrity Games. Um, as you can see, um, the core of the tool are these four uh, cases. These are narrative, um, narrative cases where the student is going through three levels of dilemmas and uh, each um, level um, what you see in the in the next level depends on your choice in the previous level. So the, as you can see, there are four cases, two on data, one on plagiarism, and one on collaboration. So the reason why we have two on data is because we wanted this to be relevant to, to a very broad range of students. So we have one that is on uh, qualitative data for the social scientists and, and people, some people from the humanities, and we have one on quantitative data for more for the for the natural sciences and, and medicine. Um, they all have the same structure, so I'll just uh, show you one case really quickly. Um, so the idea is that we, I mean, as you can see, it's not a, it's not like a World of Warcraft uh, game. Um, it is, uh, I think, what uh, was the previous speaker would call a, a gamified uh, tool. Um, so we have some elephant elements of gamification, especially we have uh, a level of immersion, uh, setting this, the student in a particular setting. You are doing this. You are facing a certain dilemma. So on the first page here, we see uh, we have the sort of the stage being set, and then um, we move on to a, a dilemma. In this case, we're doing a group work, and we have a, a group member who's not really contributing. And we are asked, "What will we? How will we um, respond to this?" And we have to make a choice. And when we make a choice, we get to the next uh, gamified element, which is the immediate feedback. We are told uh, not whether you did your choice was right or wrong, because we believe that these are these are ethical issues. So there's not a it's not the point is not that it should be right or wrong. The point is um, you should just, that your choice has consequences. And you're told about these here. In addition, over here, you can see that there is a little text box that you can expand. So this gives you a, um, a sort of more abstract account of what you've just seen. So you've just seen been immersed in a concrete situation. But actually, this concrete situation is an instance of a more general dilemma. In this case, it's about free writing and group work. And you're told about this in this little text. And you're also challenged to think about how the specific parameters of, of this context um, affects your choice. So in this case, the free rider was described as a close friend. But what if the person was not your close friend, but some more distant acquaintance? Would that affect your choice? OK, so now we uh, move on to the next level. This is a new dilemma. So it continues in a narrative way. Um, and this dilemma that we are seeing here uh, is determined by the previous answer that I gave. So if I if I chose the other option, I would see a different dilemma. Again, I make my choice. I am told what happened, immediate feedback. And then I move on to the third level. And I, uh, again, this dilemma depends on the previous one. I make my choice. And I am given the final feedback, which is sort of the end of the story in this case. You've seen a number of times that when I when I curse over certain words, there are there are little boxes popping up. So these are uh, explanations of words. These could be uh, integrity words, like uh, there isn't one on this page, but it could be something like plagiarism or ethics. Um, but it could also just be terms that we all use, but we use them in a slightly different ways. So we need to explain them to make sure that everyone is agreeing about what we're talking about. Um, so now this case is done. 
uh, I go back to the main page. And now I can play uh, one of the other cases, or I could play the same case again. And why would I want to play the same case again? Well, I could try and give a different answer at one of the levels, because then I would see different dilemmas. Um, so one thing I do is that I encourage sometimes my students to play it first the way they think is right. And then the second time they play, they try and get yourself kicked out of university to be as bad as you can. And then they will see different dilemmas. Up here at the top menu, you can see that we have um, the dictionary that I mentioned. Um, we have a, a tab here, which gives you access to particular specific dilemmas. So let's say I'm in a classroom and I want to, the students to consider just one dilemma, not play a whole uh, case. I can say, okay, go in, go into this page and uh, go to, the, to li this particular dilemma on self-plagiarism, for instance. And you can discuss that in the class. Finally, we have the teacher manual, as I mentioned before, um, where you find tips and tricks for how to use these games. And, and there's even a little video of me saying pretty much what I'm saying right now. So um, this is the, the tool. Uh, as I said, it's freely available to everyone. You can just go and use it. Um, you don't have to sign up or anything. Um, but how should you then use it? Well, uh, the tool is designed to be uh, intentionally flexible. Uh, so you can use it in many different ways. The only way you can't use it is as a um, replacement of classroom teaching. So we strongly believe that students need um, information on sort of uh, specific, the, the, the local setup, the, the local rules, local expectations of their institution. And Integrity Games does not provide that. So you can't use it as a replacement, but you can use it as a supplement. The way I use it uh, often uh, is as a... Um, as a tool for preparation. So I ask the students to play some of the cases uh, before they come to class, note down the things that they were in doubt about, um, things like that. You can also use it as an, as an assignment during a class. So let's say you have a two hour session and you want to have a break sometime and you ask them, just tell them, go to, the, go to the, um, this website and, and play this case and see what, what you find out. Of course, you can vary this, so you can have it as an individual assignment. You can also have it as a group discussion in a session, uh, where they play the tool, play the, the cases in groups. Um, or as I said, you can go into the individual dilemmas if you want to do that, because you have to uh, be aware that when you just ask them to play the cases, the students is likely to see different things. So if you can't assume that they've all seen the same, but you can do that through the dilemmas tab. So uh, the tool has been through a number of, of iterations in, in testing. Um, one thing we've asked, of course, is, is whether they like playing it. Um, so we asked students whether they thought it was fun to play, whether they agreed with the, with the claim that it's fun to play, and they uh, score an average of four out of possible five, which would be the best. Um, we also asked them if they would recommend this game to, to teachers, and they uh, answer an average 4.1 out of five being the, the best. Um, so students clearly like it. Um, we also tried to see if they actually learned something from it. Um, and of course, this is uh, something that is difficult to test. Um, what, what you're particularly interested in, of course, is knowledge retention, whether they uh, change their behavior in the long term. And this was developed last year, so we don't can't measure that yet. But we can sort of try to measure if they become better at uh, recognizing that there are certain things that are dilemmas, that there exist dilemmas in academic integrity, that it's not just sort of black and white. And we tried to measure that in a series of, of uh, experiments that we uh, that we did um, with some good colleagues. We had um, nearly 300 students uh, from many different faculties involved in these uh, tests. And the first the first part of the test is just a pre-test, post-test. So we we do a pre-test. We have them play the games, do a little group work that sort of simulates a classroom, and then we did a post-test. And uh, this part of the test went really well. Uh, we see a positive, significant improvement. Uh, for students, um, they get better at recognizing uh, gray zone um, dilemmas. So if this was all we did, and this is what people usually do when they test uh, these games, uh, I would have a very easy paper to write because I could just write one that's similar to everyone else and say that it worked. But we did something stupid. We included a control group, uh, which read a non-gamified uh, teaching note on the same topics. And it turns out that this teaching, this control group learned exactly the same or they made the same improvement. Um, so our tool works, but it doesn't work better than the teaching note that I wrote, which I know is really boring. So um, this is a, a puzzling result um, that I'm, I, th I think is 
it's particularly relevant to, to this kind of seminar where we discuss what is actually the value of having uh, gamification in in um, in uh, academic integrity training. So, um, and I'm happy to elaborate on this uh, in the Q and A, but um, as time is short, I will uh, end it here and say thank you very much. And um, looking forward to your questions later on. Thank you so much, Matt. Definitely, this is a, something that we will address later in the questionable and answers. I think it will be a great discussion, especially with this panelist and the presentation that you are making. Sonia, we move to you. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm sorry for my voice. I have a bit of a flu. So, hello and welcome. I am um, going to talk about the bridge project and games we are developing within that project. The bridge project is uh, Erasmus Plus strategic partnership between uh, six institutions, Uppsala University, uh, Southeast European University, Mandel University in Brno, Lithuanian Center for Social Sciences, uh, Kelso National Technical University and Office for the Ombudsperson for Academic Ethics and Procedures in Lithuania. And the motivation for the project was basically that we teach ethics and integrity in several different places in, uh, in the educational systems. We have perhaps courses in academic integrity, research integrity, people that study business do have courses in business ethics. And now we have also this emerging field of citizen science. And in some cases, students uh, can get courses in citizen science ethics but there is no connection between these four different fields. So what we wanted to do is basically to create three bridges from academic integrity towards research integrity, academic integrity and business ethics, and academic integrity in citizen science ethics. Um, and the target group for our, uh, for our project are master students, doctoral students, and their supervisors. So uh, you can find all of our outputs for free on this web page. Uh, you can find checklists, guidelines, open educational resources, gamified cases, workshops, webinars, etc. Uh, one of the things that was developed uh, during our projects are checklists for the academic and research integrity. Uh, the aim of those checklists uh, is to make it easier for master students and PhD students and their supervisors to, to engage in ethical writing and have a checklists with different aspects needed to, to produce um, need, needing to produce papers and their master thesis. In addition to these checklists, we have developed several different games and several different type of games, because the aim of our project was also to, to see what kind of ethical games we might want to have. So, for instance, we developed small word-based games to learn the terminology in a fun way. Uh, those are just perhaps not even for this level. We just thought it was fun to test it. So they are also on our website. Then we decided to develop a board game for bridging integrity in these four fields. And uh, this, uh, this uh, board game is actually a very good starter for discussions on academic integrity. Um, everyone likes board games. It's beautifully designed by our colleagues at uh, Mandel University. And here you have a picture from one of our uh, learning, teaching and training events in North Macedonia, where people got really engaged in playing that game. Uh, the game is downloadable on, from our website. So you have this board and you have questions. And uh, the idea is to describe or to make pictures, to explain different concepts, etc. cetera. Um, it's a very good starter to see what works, what doesn't work? Are we all on the same level? Do we dis define things in the same way? So we think uh, that board game might be a good starter just before, in the beginning of a course in, in, in uh, academic integrity or research ethics, but it also covers uh, business ethics and citizen science ethics. So go check it out. Um, another type of game 
that we are developing are multiple choice storytelling games. Uh, because while the first uh, type of games have shown just teacher concepts and the second just showing that we are all on the same level, in multiple choice storytelling games, you develop ethical thinking in order to see the consequences of the decisions you make. So these are dilemma games, a bit similar to integrity projects, um, where you go, you, you have a role, and you have you, you there are there is a problem, you get different options, you choose next one, and then you see what happens if you've chosen uh, that path, etc. So it's it the story develops in different ways, uh, de de uh, depending on what choice you make. Uh, during our learning, teaching and training events, we also encourage our participants, uh, which are master students, PhD students and supervisors, to co-create games together with us. Um, we think that this is a way of getting people creative, getting people to... to to articulate the knowledge they already have about ethics. So for instance, here you have barometer, integrity barometer that was developed uh, during one of these uh, LTTs in uh, North Macedonia. Uh, where basically you had a scale on the floor and the questions were asked, different types of dilemmas, and then everyone would move to the point where they agree with something. Uh, so you can see in a group, uh, this is very good game to, to see that the whole group has the same ethical standards, for instance, or in, and it's also a good way of a uh, good starting point for a discussion. Uh, that was just one of the games uh, that was created during, so we have analog games as well, not only digital games. And um, during the project, we will have a description of this type of games. Um, in order to for people to implement that in the classes. Another thing we are developing within the Bridge project are guidelines for research ethics and research integrity in citizen science. And citizen science is a concept that's not really widely known everywhere. So, uh, first time we uh, started to present guidelines, we presented them with a normal presentation and people were not really responding in a nice way. They were not sure what we are talking about. It took them some time, so it's, it wasn't so fun. And then um, during one of our learning, teaching and training events in Vilnius, uh, after such a presentation, basically, we decided that we are going to play theater instead. So what happened? We created a role play in citizen science ethics. One person was uh, had a role of being a PhD student. He wanted to do um, a citizen science project uh, and involve citizen scientists uh, in order to, um, to get samples uh, from glaciers, uh, which was not possible for him to do all over the place. We had his supervisors, we had a couple of citizen scientists that were from our group. And then basically when the audience came, we engaged them as well. So we had an advisory board for citizens, for this supervisor. We had a funding agency, we had the institutional oversight agency. A couple of people were also asked to, to be citizen scientists. And then uh, we described the project, I was leading the project, and it was really fun. Everyone got really engaged. Um, and we asked them to try to figure out what ethical challenges might be, uh, might be interesting in that kind of project. What type of ethical challenges you'd like to address in such a project. Basically, what our supervisors, which were... Uh, in that particular case, uh, they came up with a list of the same topics we covered in our guidelines. And after that, after presenting these themes, they were actually really engaged in reading what we had to say in our guidelines. For instance, for informed consent, we had 
different guidelines and they thought it was suddenly very interesting very relevant because we just had uh, that type of game so not all games need to be uh, need to be something that you do digitally but it's always a good starting point for a discussion in addition to to that role play when it comes to citizen science ethics uh, for all of these themes that are covered we have small vignettes where you have a description of what's uh, happening then you have some questions um and uh, but there are people that are using these vignettes are asked to to decide about something they get points they get feedback um, also in the text and then they can read more about it in the guidelines it's also a way to connect the guidelines exemplify them through the games now what's next in the pipeline is developing educational modules and in these modules uh, we are connecting everything that we've done already uh, for instance, now we are creating modules for promoting integrity in authorship and publication, academic integrity and artificial intelligence in the, is in the pipeline. We are creating videos, we are using our games that we have developed, uh, we are going to have links, uh, documents, etc. Uh, and package this as an educational model that can be used within other courses. Um, we, I would also like to invite everyone who's interested in the bridge project on our second multiply bridge, bridge event. It's international conference on integrity in higher education, business and society on May 18th. It's going to be an online conference and call for abstracts uh, is out. The deadline is now March 20th. So you still have some more days to create it. You can find project outputs here and thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia, and thank you for the brilliant presentations from Zinat and Mats. Um, as I said in the chat, the, the question and answers is open, so if you have any questions, please um, write them down. There was a question, I think it is for Mats, about uh, um, a, 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 a term that was written, and uh, if it's if it was a... a um, a translation for from Danish. It's scenes. So, Matt, uh, is this a, a translation like still where was Danish it? Where word? was it written? Um, uh, it was like in a, your presentation. Scenes. Was um, it in my presentation? Oh, yeah. I, Perhaps I am uh, not the best speller in the world, so it might just be. Uh, um, uh, let me check. Um, a list of scenarios in the game. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I am not sure. Uh, it's probably a mistake. It's not a word in any of the languages that I know. Uh, okay. so it's a spelling mistake. My apologies. Uh, I, can, I hope it's I not very confusing. To uh, I can share and show you where it is. Mm -hmm. Here, this one. Skins, skins, this one. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so it, this is this is um, yeah, that's quite important. Uh, okay, so this is the this is the level. Uh, so since uh, I don't know why it said since um, it's it's the, the so number one is the first dilemma you see. The one that is two is is any of the, the two dilemmas that you will see depending on what you choose in level one. Number three are the ones that you might see after um, your choices too. So it's basically the sort of the branching structure that is in the in the game. Um, so yeah, um, and one thing that um, given that question, um, one thing that I didn't talk about uh, is that um, we have kept uh, when when you get to the last page. There, we've kept the, the the sort of little number that you can see. It's also this is also in a teacher manual. But you can uh, you one thing I do when I use this tool is that I ask the students to note down which page they ended up on. Um, so this is the number of the, uh, the there's a little uh, code which is the page, um, because that tells me what choices they made through the game, and I can when you know the structure of the cases, uh, you know um, 
So if they all end up in number uh, three, one and three, four, that means that they disagreed on level one. So I take that the dilemma in class and discuss that with them because I can see uh, if I make a little survey pre sur uh, prior to the class, I can see, well, 60% of you answered this and 40% of you answered this. So I can, I, it's not just that people out there agree, you, you disagree on this. So let's have a discussion about. Um, so it's, it's a way to, you can also use this game to find out what the students in this particular class are disagreeing about and also what they are agreeing about. Um, we often find that they, um, they're, I also ask them often before a class whether they've been in doubt about uh, good practice within these three areas, uh, collaboration, plagiarism, and, and data. And they are very much in doubt about plagiarism because they've, they've heard a lot about it and, and they've been taught a lot about it. But they actually agree very much on what the right thing to do is. They always end up on the same page and they end up on the one that we want them to end up on. <laughs> so they're actually, so there's, there's some fear in the student that they, we don't, yeah. there's something about plagiarism that we don't understand and we're doing it wrong, but actually they're not, they're actually quite good in thinking. And I think that's um, a challenge for, for this type. I don't, I'm just, please stop me if I'm going too far, but uh, it's an interest for me. It's uh, what working with this tool has led me to is, is really thinking about if we're going to gamify uh, teaching tools on academic integrity, we should gamify them in the right way. And, 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 and the way, it seems that what I can see in the literature is that the reason why gamification works is that it keeps students to the task, keeps them um, interested in what they're doing. And this works well if there's some sense of competition and there's some sense of reward. So, but the trouble for us in this kind of game that we're making is that you can't reward them for making the right answer because there is no right answer. Uh, these are dilemmas that you can't, you can't yeah. say they did it right or wrong. So you have to reward their thinking. So you, you sort of, Whatever you whatever you answered, you thought right, and this is for me. It's really a challenge to to get to developing games in academic integrity because if you want to have a game on interesting things, you can't have a right or wrong answer, but you can have right or wrong thinking. But how do you gamify that? That's a really uh, uh, that that's a thing that I would really like to to learn how to do because I think that's the if we're going to make good games in academic integrity, that's what we need to do basically. So that yes. was a long blabber on this one word, sorry. Yeah, but I agree. I think it's very hard to, to, to give credit for what the right thing is to do, because sometimes uh, people in the real life get, you know, they, are, they have some advantages if they behave unethically. So if you have a game, should we show that? You know, or not, because otherwise you're creating an ecosystem within a game that's not really, uh, you know, that differs quite a lot from, from, from the real life. And of course, you don't want to put uh, the negative, don't want to give them awards for something negative. But, you know, in real life, it, these type of things happen. Yeah. And, and we, we very intentionally did that in integrity games. So you can, you can see that when sometimes, for instance, in the collaboration case, when you when you do what we think, what many students perceive to be the right thing, for instance, if you see someone cheating and you, and you tell the teacher, then some of the feedback that you get is that you, I mean, this person gets really mad at you and will not talk to you. And, and you are sort of, you get a little bit excluded from the social environment because that's what happens. Um, so we, we try to show them that there are consequences, even of doing what is often perceived to be the, the ethically right thing to do. And also the other way that sometimes, I think there is one of the cases where you actually get away with cheating. Um, and and that's because it's I mean in real life people do <laughs> so yes. yeah and, that's why I think it's dilemmas yeah. are very important because we want to shape them to to make ethical choices even if it's going to be hard basically and it, it would be much easier to behave unethically mm. not to be a whistleblower blower or, or yeah yeah and and, and I, how Sorry, so I was just thinking, and I would like to, to raise this discussion here with this panel, is how often, you mentioned about the dilemmas, how often the morality of uh, with the friends, when this involves being a good student or being a good friend, when they see, when students see uh, they, they a fellow student doing something that is not ethical, uh, 
their conflicts of royalty, how they play in terms of and, and how you saw this when you were testing your tools. Was this something that was prevalent? Um, so uh, it's some well, um, it, it, we we did as I mentioned in the presentation, we did a lot of um, empirical work before we developed this tool. So we had uh, interviews with uh, 72 students from different countries about what experiences they have. We did a major survey, as you know, Rita, on um, with 6,000 6, students participating um, about what they sort of feel as common. And, and one of the major findings in the qualitative stuff is exactly this tension between, uh, we wrote a paper called Good Friend, a Good Student. We could, that, that's really the, the tension that they feel sometimes, that they, they perceive certain expectations from their institution to do certain things, and then they have a codex for being a good friend that they also want to try and adhere to. And they see a tension between these two. And we very much tried to build that into to integrity games because we, we thought that, well, this is, given that this is something the students tell us, this is something we should prepare them for. Um, so that's why, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the situation with Kim, for instance, that this person is your friend and, and this, this does something to your to the to the social part, and then we ask them in the, for instance, in the about your choice text, what would happen if this person was not your friend? Because then you take out the friend part of the equation, and then they might actually act differently. Uh, so that's a an interesting discussion to have with students in, in the class as well. And and I tried to do that when I, I so I, as I said, I used it as a preparation, and they play the game, and then they come to class, and I says, well, how would you how would you react differently if it, if it was not your friend? Um, and then, and there, there is seems to be some sort of, I mean, it, I think it's to some extent it's also it's students' perception about what they they think the institution wants because in many cases we actually want students to be good friends uh, because that's the way <laughs> they learn best. Um, so uh, it's also about addressing that. Um, if I can maybe uh, jump in here a bit, sure. um, play the devil's advocate here. Um, looking at the free rider, um, the two choices that you have given to students. And I understand how you said that there is no right or wrong in this case, because given the two choices that you have given. But, you know, there is a third choice that the student's just going to do the work for his friend. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's where then the right or wrong comes in. So that's definitely not a gray area. That's a black and white choice. And these are the kind of things that you'll have to think about if you want to do any kind of gamification in terms of points or rewards, right? So where you're giving them two right choices, which is the more right or more wrong, that you don't have an answer. But there is an obvious wrong choice that students do take most of the time, which is, that uh, they'll just end up doing the work for their friend. Or if yeah. they're in a group, there are five people, two people are only working, three are not. Those two people very rarely will come up and tell anybody. Sometimes they will try to talk to the friends in the group and they will not do the work. And what happens? The two people end up doing all the work, right? So that needs to be then reflected in the choices because if you actually put it as a choice, that's the one that, that everybody's going to take, that mm -hmm. I will end up doing the work for my friend because, and you know, the way you put the scenario that he's he's having trouble, he's got problems, he doesn't understand, he's also got several subjects. So as a friend, I would understand what my, fr my friend's situation is. And a majority of students will come and say, of course, I'm going to help my friend and do the project for him. I don't know if they will do. That. I mean, I, I, in 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 my classes, it's they they are divided on that one, uh, roughly sixty forty, whether they will, uh, what they answer. Um, I, I, and what another an interesting twist on. I, I don't remember if we built that in, but um, uh, that was a in the interviews. It turned out so. One of the things they perceive very differently is whether they they find it difficult or whether there is some sort of external thing. For instance, if the person is very ill, if the the, uh, the family member is very ill. Yeah. Then the the students will definitely do the work for the person because they want to help. Um, but they, if they perceive the person as lazy, they don't. If they if if it's because it's difficult, it's something in between. And it's um, I don't know. I, I'm I'm not going to say that there's a definite right or wrong to those answers to those questions. But um, I think it's important to discuss with students what is it that the institution expects, what is it that they expect, and is there actually a tension between their um, 
because it, it's about integrity, right? I mean, in some way, uh, academic integrity is, is, a, is, a, is a contradiction in terms because you can't have integrity in one area without having it in, in, in all areas. And that's what the students feel that, that, that I, I mean, I want personal integrity and personal integrity means being a good friend and a good student. And if I can't have both, then I'm in trouble. That's where the dilemma comes. Uh, but maybe it's because they are misunderstanding what the student, what the institution expects of them. And then that's my role as a teacher to tell them, well, this is what the uh, what this is what the institution expects, and and I can't put that in the game because it that will differ from institution to institution. But I can tell mm -hmm. them what we expect in Copenhagen, and and then they can see if that helps them develop integrity in a more general sense. But do we generally, for instance, want in real life outside of academics, do we want somebody to help somebody embezzle money? No, right. No. It doesn't matter how bad a situation that person might be in, that they desperately need that money. And I don't have the money to help my friend, but they need to embezzle this money. Would I help that friend? Mm. Of course not, right? It's integrity. Mm. It's mm. just pure and simple integrity. I wouldn't help that person mm. embezzle and do something wrong, right? So it's it's that understanding that we, we need to bring into students. It's not about, I want to help a friend and be a good friend. Mm. What does that good friend mean? What what does that What does that look like? Mm. So uh, maybe I disagree here a bit that I don't think there is a gray in, in this case. Uh, we need to also have that uh, very united message to students saying this is what it really means. What do I what do I mean when I say I uh, this person has integrity? It's mm. integrity. Like you said, it has to be in all aspects of life, not just academics. And I, I don't think academic and integrity uh, clash. They don't. Um, this is this is what's preparing them to be the better people once they've come out of our classrooms, yeah. right? So yeah. when they're outside and they've got that friend who needs that help, they need to know what is the right help to give and not the wrong type of help to give just because it's a friend. Mm. But I think there is a difference between embezzlement and helping on an assignment. No, of course, I've uh, taken an extreme, so, so, but, yeah. you know, but that, if, you're but, but that, at, if you're looking at a student doing work, right, and you're trying to assess that person's work and there's somebody else doing his or her work, I don't know what this person's work really is. And they're, they're still getting the mark, mm. which is unethical, mm. right? So that's that's what that's why I was comparing it to something else outside uh, outside of a classroom. Yeah, but I, so I, I think there is there is a what what this what this tool does is that it it focuses very much on the gray zones, right? So there is right. there are cases that are outright. Uh, if if you go, I, I'm putting down because in in my head I see these I see these branching trees, right? So if you go to level three and go to the very bottom of that tree, there is something where you ask, would you, would you do this, which would be outright cheating, um, and right. and there you can say if you end up there, uh, you, you've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. you're just wrong and um, and so we take that because we know that in class we talk about well there are things that are just not allowed there are things that are illegal um but the, to, to me at least they are boring to talk about because the, most students <laughs> know i mean they know that they're not allowed to copy three pages from the internet into their assignment they know that they're not allowed to pay someone to write their assignments for them that's not interesting what's interesting to talk about is all the gray stuff in between mm -hmm. because it, the, the, those who those who do the very severe cheating, they will not stop doing that just because we tell them not to. The, the teaching doesn't work on them because it okay. it's it's the whole incentive, the, the 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 grade, the race to get good grades, the the pressure from family, whatever it is that gets them there. So teaching won't work on them, but teaching will work on the gray zones because there we can help them navigate these. And to help them navigate gray zones, we need to give them gray zone examples um, where it's not clear because that's what they face in real life. And, and there, I think we have this gamification challenge that we can't reward, reward them, award them, reward them for, for, um, for giving the right answer, but we can uh, reward them for thinking in the right way. But that's a tricky one. Being uh, the, the, the discussion is very interesting, but we need to be cautious on, on time. We are reaching <laughs> the end. There's a, a, a great question from Emma about uh, do any of the dilemmas include artificial intelligence? Uh, as I think the dilemmas around that are, are very interesting. Uh, Sonia already addressed it. What about you, yes. Matt and Zina? We are going to develop it in the bridge project. Um, we don't have. Uh, we don't have it in the um, directly, at least in the uh, integrity games. We do have it in the sense that 
Um, we have a line of, there's a sort of a thread in the collaboration case where you're getting increasing amount of help from someone um, on your assignment. So first the person corrects commas and then they start correcting the, the mm -hmm. contents. And in a sense, you could say, I mean, you could, so you could have a discussion with the student. What is the difference between having your mom setting the commas and what and having chat GBT doing it? What is the difference between having chat GBT writing your assignment and your mother writing the assignment? Um, and so, so that kind of it, it, so it can lead into that kind of discussion, but it doesn't uh, sort of have chat yeah. GBT in the in the text. Uh, that's yes, we are developing that? modules, so that's that's going to be addressed. But it, we haven't done it yet. It's so pretty new; it wasn't actually included in the bridge project. We just wanted mm -hmm. to to develop it as it yeah. is. Our actually. one was very narrow. It was just looking at plagiarism at this stage. But we are hoping to be looking at next round of grants so we can continue that work. But very well. So um, just a final question, so, and it will be for me, for all of you. Uh, you mentioned about your co-creation process with the teachers involving the students as well. And we've been discussing um, from the perspective of the student, the importance of the gamify, gamification uh, tools that you develop. I'm thinking from the perspective of the teacher, how would you support the teacher in terms if, if a teacher wants to implement your tools? Um, in, in terms of workshops, you, Matt, you mentioned about the, the the manual for the teacher, but often the curriculum for for from the for the teacher is very very straight. It doesn't leave space to include those tools. So, how would you recommend a teacher that wants to implement your tools? I don't know. Who wants to start first? Okay, I can go. So our our module isn't necessarily for a classroom because we do also recognize exactly what you've said, that teachers themselves have fixed curriculums that they're trying to get through as very tight schedule in any given setting, whether it's schools or universities. Um, we are we're targeting it as something um, either somebody can, a student can try out themselves, a teacher can direct students to, or a university can use as a learning module for their students, like for instance, when during orientations or um, any kind of restorative uh, program that they may have for students who have uh, maybe had an allegation against them on plagiarism, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where we are looking at um, positioning our, our tool. Yeah, and like I said, we have, um... We have developed the tool to be very flexible, also in recognizing that if we just made like a two hour module that this is what you have to go through this module, then no one would use it. Um, but we made one that can be used outside of the class in preparation and we can use it inside the class in whatever way the teacher wants. Um, there is a teacher manual where, um, with some suggestions about how to use it. Um, and um, of course, we are happy to, I mean, people contact me from time to time and we talk about how they how they might use it in their class. Um, so yeah, they're, um, the teacher manual is basically the answer to your question, I think. Yeah. Uh, and question, in terms of language, Matt, I know your, your tools are available in different language. Zina and Sonia, I believe your tools will also be, at least for the bridge project, available in different languages. So no, we are just... mainly doing in, uh, in English. In English? Uh, okay. But some, some yeah. of the things we are producing are going to be in other languages. And we encourage people, it's all uh, open. And as I haven't answered for your last and previous question, you haven't asked, you jumped over me. I just wanted to say that uh, whatever we are producing, you can have games as separate entities. Uh, we have uh, manuals for teachers, but also we have modules. So if teacher would like to, to incorporate the whole module, it's okay. We are going to be in English mainly as well. Okay, so we are closing the session. Thank you very much. Thank you for your wonderful presentation and for the tools you developed. They're all available. Thank you for the audience for your questions and see you for I hope I see you for the next webinar on the 14th of April where we will be presenting about the NI recommendations on the ethical use of artificial intelligence a topic that we've been discussing now <laughs> and 
talk about the European Conference on Ethics and Integrity that this year will be held in Derby, UK, uh, uh, from the 12th until the 14th of July. Thank you very much for everyone for being here.